Yes, driving up yesterday, it kept getting cooler and cooler. <laughs> Thank God for New York. <laughs> yes, it is a pleasure to be here. And you know, it's going to be a good day when you pull in the parking lot and everyone who gets out of their cars is headed to the fellowship building and they're carrying food. Uh, so <laughs> praise the Lord for that too. Uh, last year, I'm sorry that I was unable to be here, but did have the thyroid removed uh, about a week before the 4th. So everything is going great. I'm thankful for how good the Lord is and his blessings that are manifold. You can turn with me to the book of Proverbs 3. Proverbs chapter 3, we will this morning, Lord willing, talk about Baptist history. Just give you some things that uh, perhaps you may find it interesting uh, during the morning message. Uh, we'll give you some Bible and then a very unique message this afternoon uh, planned for you. So I hope you'll be able to stay for that. I trust things are going well for you all. Thank you, preacher, for the invitation to be here once again. And we look forward to what the Lord is going to do and to much good fellowship. Proverbs 3, and we'll begin reading with verse 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Father, we thank you for your word. God, it is good to be here at the meeting house with the saints today. Father, we ask your blessing now upon the scripture and upon the presentation of our heritage, Lord. May both be a help to the saints here. We thank you for your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in his name we ask these things. Amen. And the Bible here does give instruction to the people of God to honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Not a message on tithing this morning, but rather a Baptist history and to talk about some who were much used of the Lord to give. Some of the names you are familiar with, well, perhaps all of them, but... There are many who have honored the Lord with their substance. I know that I'm in the midst of a people who do that very thing. Uh, there are some whom God gave more substance than others, and we'll talk a little about them this morning. Certainly, you know the name Colgate, and it is associated with your state and Colgate University, started by the Baptist here. And you remember, especially those of you who went on the trips, that Hamilton Literary and Theological Institute was changed to Colgate University whenever William Colgate presented them quite a large check. And they thought, well, maybe we can change our name. And they did. But Colgate, born in England, 1783, he made his way by boat to this country. The captain talked with him as they traveled, and he asked, where are you going? He said, well, I'm headed to America. He said, what are you going to do? He said, I believe I'll make soap. And the captain said, well, if you make soap, make the best soap there is and do it to the glory of God. And he said, I will. He said one other thing. He said, when God begins to bless you, and he will, make sure you give him 10% in return. Colgate said, I'll do that. And so he made his way here, and he did indeed start the, uh, the Colgate Company, soap makers. Uh, some of you probably use the Baptist toothpaste as well. And uh, God did bless him, yeah. and uh, he was true to his word. He gave 10% of all that came in to the Lord. And then he thought, I'm not giving enough. And so he increased it to 20%, and then to 30, uh, to 40, 50%. And so William Colgate is given 50% of everything that came into his company to the Lord. 
And God used that in a great way. And of course, his son Samuel continued the work as head of the Colgate Company. And as a saved Baptist, he continued to give to Baptist causes while collecting a large library, over 30,000 volumes. And he gave that then to Colgate University, and that became the center of what is today the American Baptist Historical Society archives. And they have about 80,000 volumes today, but it started with what Colgate gave, and his volumes were predominantly Baptist. He had collected many of their writings, letters, manuscripts, and preserved them for us. So God used him in a great way, and we're grateful. It had an effect upon uh, this state, and you know the history of Hamilton, Colgate, how that it literally, as far as missions is concerned, affected the world, and uh, what a blessing that is. Uh, in England, William Kiffin, perhaps you remember the story. If you have seen a copy of the painting which we commission, a lively experiment talking about John Clark receiving the royal charter from King Charles II in England, just behind Clark in the picture stands William Kiffin. Kiffin, a well-known Baptist preacher in London, and at the time, there in the 1600s, he was the wealthiest man in London. Baptist preacher, wealthiest man. He made his, his living, his fortune from wool. He imported and distributed wool from around the world. God blessed that. When King Charles came to the throne, King Charles II, remember his if you know English history, his father had, had been removed from the throne. Cromwell came in. After Cromwell is removed, then, then comes King Charles II. And the country is bankrupt as far as the government is concerned at that time. So he went to William Kiffin. And he asked Kiffin to loan him 40,000 pounds so that he might reestablished the government. Kif Kiffin was a very wise man, in addition to being very rich. He gave the king 10,000 pounds. Wouldn't loan him anything, he just gave it to him. And his friend said, William, why did you give him 10,000 pounds instead of loaning him 40,000? He said, because it's better to lose 10,000 than 40,000. <laughs> Uh, he, he knew he wasn't going to get it back one way or another. And so that's what he did. And in that scene where Clark is receiving the royal charter after laboring 12 years to get it for Rhode Island, he, uh, the indication is, the idea is, and this is true, that one reason why King Charles II was willing to grant the Baptist in Rhode Island the opportunity to practice their faith in liberty without being persecuted for it was because of the leverage from the Baptist preacher William Kiffin having given him 10,000 pounds. And so while the Baptists are dying in the dungeons in England, he gives that charter to Rhode Island so that the Baptist here would be able to practice their faith, conduct that lively experiment. And this being the day that it is, you do remember, I hope, that much of that charter written by John Clark himself is what underlies the founding of the United States and our founding documents as far as religious liberty is concerned. So we do owe a great debt to uh, those Baptists. Uh, Kraft, you know that, James Lewis Kraft, and we're going to have food this afternoon. We're talking about food this morning. Uh, you know that he also was a well-known Baptist. And Kraft taught Sunday school in a Baptist church for over 50 years. Saved men, good testimony, and 
you can make your way to Green Lake, Wisconsin. There you'll find the American Baptist campgrounds and retreat center, 1,000 acres purchased by Kraft and donated to the Baptist there. If you go into the Roger Williams Inn to the basement, there you can go in a little room and there's a rock collection and Kraft collected rocks from all over the world. His rock collection is there. If you press a little button on the front of that collection, you're going to hear one of his Sunday school um, lessons and it's talking about creation and God making those rocks. And it's very interesting. So he gave much to the cause of the Lord, especially to the Baptist, and God blessed him. Uh, you perhaps are familiar with the name Pillsbury, uh, George Pillsbury, also a well-known Baptist in Minnesota. Pillsbury College was named after him. He was instrumental in its founding, and as long as he lived, uh, the school there was founded for the purpose of training men for the ministry, and as long as he lived, he directed that the company, Pillsbury Company, supply all of the food necessary for those men as long as they were in school. And uh, he took care of those things. He was glad to be able to do so. Now, you're familiar with the name Rockefeller, uh, being here in New York. And uh, Rockefeller, of course, he was born 1839. He did not have a good childhood as far as his father is concerned. His father was a drunkard. He would leave home and be gone for months at a time. They didn't know where he was. Uh, one thing he wanted his sons to know when he was home was that they could only get along in this world if they were good con men. They had to cheat and they had to steal. But praise the Lord, Rockefeller's mother was a Christian lady. She was a faithful member of the Baptist church. She made sure her children were with her in church every time the doors opened. And she taught him the Lord. He was saved as a young man, member of a Baptist church until the day that he died. His mother taught him that willful waste makes woeful want. And so he became very industrious and very thrifty. He saved and he saved and he saved as a child. He invested and invested as an adult and God blessed that. And you know that during his life, he was the richest man in the world. And if you calculate it out to what it, his fortune would be worth in uh, today's value, he still is known as the richest man of all time. And God blessed him. Uh, he attended Baptist Church there in New York City. He served as a deacon. He served as clerk. And during his years, he served as janitor of the church. Mm. Richest man in the world cleaning the meeting house because he knew that he was doing something for the Lord. And uh, no task was too low for him. He'd often have his pastor over to dine with him and was good friends, supported the work of the Lord in every way he could. At the New York Historic Society, New York City, I remember going there. The lady said, how may I help you? I said, I'm studying about John D. Rockefeller. I want to get some kind of information about his faith and his giving to the Lord. She said, wait right here. So I sat down. She disappears behind a door. And a few moments later, she comes back and she's pushing a library cart and it's loaded with boxes. And she said, take a look at this. And so I opened the first box and it's filled with ledgers and it's all in his handwriting from start to back of every one of the ledgers. $1,000 to this Baptist church. $500, $5,000, $50,000, $20,000. All to Baptist churches all over the country, all around the world, from front to back. That's what he's doing. 
And I look at the next ledger, same thing, completely filled from front to back, gifts to Baptist churches, thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Every ledger in that box the same way. Every ledger in every box was the same way. What he had given to Baptist churches. And, you know, a lot of people can find some bad things to say about a, a lot of men, but there are a lot of people who have done a lot of good things. We ought to remember those too. And she came back, the lady did, and she said, you find what you wanted? I said, well, I found something good. Uh, I don't know if it's all I was looking for or had in mind when I got here, but I asked her, do you know what this is? She said, oh, yes, I do. And she said, what's even more remarkable is just on the other side of that door, there are 20 more carts filled with boxes that have exactly the same thing in them. And uh, the man honored the Lord with his substance. And uh, God blessed him. That's something we can do. We can honor the Lord with our substance. You say, I'm not a Rockefeller. None of us are. And uh, not likely that we ever will be. But aren't you thankful that God is a God of equity? And he'll bless us just as much if we honor the Lord with what substance we have as he will a Rockefeller. And we can be just as faithful in our day. The young girl, Jessie Ball, grew up in Virginia. She attended the Maratico Baptist Church there and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as a young girl, faithful to her church. And that church, an historic Baptist church, uh, Louis Lunsford, persecuted Baptist preacher. He, he labored as pastor there until his death. He was the one who was able to lead King Carter to the Lord. King Carter at the time was the richest man in America. And whenever King Carter got saved, now the wealthiest man in America is Satan, he's a Baptist, and so the persecution began to wane because now they have influence and they have money behind them. And so the Lord works all of those things. But Jessie Ball, she's growing up in that church and she's in a different generation as another little girl who grew up in that church and her name was Henrietta Hall. Henrietta Hall, you might remember, uh, married Louis Shuck. They went together as missionaries to China. She, the first female missionary ever to labor in China. God's using that little church there in Virginia. Jesse Ball married. She moved away. And if you ever visit that church, it's absolutely beautiful, uh, meticulous, uh, the grounds are, are kept in just that manner. Uh, the meeting house, 1846, uh, it is kept in good condition at all times. And I'm talking with the pastor and he's saying, uh, Jesse remembered the church in her trust. And uh, anything that we need, all of the groundskeeping, uh, the upkeep on the building, the maintenance, it's paid for out of her trust. He said, my vacation Myself and my entire family, we can go anywhere in the world we want for two weeks uh, out of the year, and it's paid for completely out of her trust. The salary, my salary, half of it comes out of her trust. It'll be that way for every pastor who ever pastors at this church, half the salary is paid for out of her trust. And he said every five years there's a complete technological update for the church paid for out of her trust. At that time, the early days when the orphanage that Henrietta Hall started in China, uh, it was still in existence. It was paid for out of Jesse Ball's trust. And he said, in fact, she gives so much money to the church. She's dead, but she gives so much money to the church that the deacons have to meet every week of the year to decide where we're going to put this money. And he said she loved her church. And even though she had to move away when she was married. She remembered the Lord. She remembered her church. And the name Jessie Ball might not mean much to you, but tack on her, uh, her married name of DuPont, and uh, you get the idea of where the money comes from. 
And um, that's good. It's good that people remember uh, the Lord. And uh, Robert Arthington, another name with which you may not be familiar, but Robert Arthington, he grew up in England. He got saved. He was working for his father in his father's brewery. And when he got saved, he, he said, Dad, I can't do this anymore. He said, this is not right. And, of course, his dad disagreed with him, but Robert left the family company but continued to witness to his parents until they got saved. And his father then understood, and he liquidated his assets. Didn't sell the company so that someone else could continue the evil. He liquidated everything. And he gave um, a bit of that. It was uh, 200,000 pounds to his son. His son just took it and invested it. He forgot all about it. But he still had much money. He attended the meetings of the Baptist Missionary Society there in England. And he was moved by what was happening through missions. And especially of the work in the country of the Cameroon there in Africa. And Alfred Saker was the missionary whom God used from England to open that company, uh, that country rather, to uh, the work and the preaching of the gospel. Now, if I were to ask you, who is the most well-known missionary in the history of Africa, what would you say? Livingston. Livingston. Instantly. Get that answer everywhere. Uh, I do this message. But Livingston wasn't much of a missionary. Had really one genuine convert that people know about. Uh, so um, missions, you know, is quite a different thing than most of the world thinks it is. Missions is preaching the gospel and planting churches. And that's something that Livingston didn't do. But Livingston did say this. He said that the greatest missionary that Africa has ever known is the Baptist, Alfred Saker. And Saker went into that country of the Cameroon, and uh, there was no gospel witness. The people there were heathen. Now, I'm not degrading anyone. You certainly understand that that's what we all are before we get saved, heathen. And uh, the people there were heathen. Uh, they were savages, and he began to preach the gospel to them. And it was difficult. Uh, they resisted, but... Some finally believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Got a church planted there. Continued to plant churches up and down the river there in the Cameroon. But it was very difficult to even live there because getting the supplies, uh, the Bibles, clothing, food, uh, the printing presses, whatever they needed up and down the river, uh, they had to do it in dugouts. And it was very, very time-consuming and difficult. And so the need, the prayer need that came before the Baptist Missionary Society there in England in which Arlington attended was we need a steamboat that we can navigate this river and it will be more effective and we can get uh, the supplies necessary and get the missionaries to where they need to be to preach the gospel. And uh, he asked that they'd pray about it and consider doing something to help. Well, Arlington had money, and so he paid for a steamboat, named it Peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, and sent it there to Cameroon. He paid for it all, 4,000 pounds, and continued to pay for its upkeep as long as he lived. And the country opened up and blossomed in a great way. After Saker died and he gave his all, uh, to the Lord. He honored the Lord with his substance. Uh, he, he would give personally. Uh, he'd show those natives, he'd take his own tools and show them how to build homes in which to live. And they rewarded him by stealing the tools. <laughs> and so uh, they, he'd get more tools, same thing would happen. But he's there for the Lord. He's not there for himself. And I know that Maybe some of you younger ones do, but I know at least some of you older ones remember the old radio show called The Shadow. 
and the, the shadow knows. <laughs> well, Saker, he sacrificed so much and labored so diligently that he wasted away to nothing. He was just skin and bones. And that was the name the natives gave to the preacher. They called him the shadow because uh, he had wasted away to uh, nearly nothing. And he died there. God used it, but many churches had been planted. He trained other missionaries to go into other countries. The Congo was open to the gospel because of the efforts of Saker in training missionaries like George Grenfell, another Baptist who would go into that country. And of course, in the Congo River there in that country, is, it is the largest river in the world as far as volume is concerned. Uh, more water flows from the mouth of that river than any other river uh, around the globe. And uh, being a river that would run the length of that country and uh, the rest of Africa, uh, it was necessary for them to have a boat there as well. But they couldn't get another one. And the folks in Cameroon were getting along well now. The country's open and the churches are flourishing. And so they decided to dismantle the piece and take it over into Congo. They sent an engineer from England to do the job. He died en route. They tried it two more times, sent two more engineers. Both of them died before they could start the work. And so Grenfell thought, it's up to me. The only experience he'd had with any machinery was growing up and working in his father's hardware store in England. But he and the natives began dismantling uh, that that boat and 800 pieces of the boat and they carried it by hand across the mountains to the, the Congo and then the task of reassembling. Now if you're like me it's easy for things to be taken apart. <laughs> Getting them back together in the right, right way that's something altogether different and uh, the natives thought this will never work. But Grenfell put that boat back together and gave the order for them to start it, and it started. The natives cheered and said, the peace, she lives, she lives. And for 26 years, uh, that boat went up and down that Congo River uh, taking the gospel uh, to those villages. And many, many thousands of those natives came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And that's because one man, to begin with, honored the Lord with his substance, Robert Arlington, there in England. And we're back to him. He was a wealthy man, but he gave everything that he had to missions. Everything. Early on in his Christian life, he heard a letter from a missionary. It was read, and it said... The missionary said, if I had known as a young man what I know now and can see what the gospel does for lost souls as I have seen, he said, I would have denied myself every worldly pleasure and would have given everything to missions. Well, when Arthington died, they went into his home and here's what they found. For he took that to heart. They found a box that he used as a table. A crate that he used as a chair. No bed, no other furniture in the house. This wealthy man, they found one coat that he had worn for 17 years. And then they learned that the 200000 that he had invested as a young man he learned just three years before he died, the investment company came to him and said, you do know that you have money in your account. He said, well, I had forgotten about that. He said, how much is it? Well, the 200,000 pounds that you invested is now worth 2,800,000 pounds. He said, good, I want it. 
They, they got it to him, and you know what he did with it? He gave all of it to missions. He is responsible for opening up mission stations in Africa, South America, China, all over Europe, around the world, because he wanted to see souls saved. It's amazing. The people will honor the Lord in such a way with their substance. And, uh, you know, God help us to do the same. We, we've already said it, we don't have what others have or what others may have had. But we can still obey the Lord. And God can use it. You know, God can get more out of a penny than any other person. Mm -hmm. He can do with it sure what he wants to. And he can accomplish what he desires if we'll just be willing to give. And that's not just our substance. You know that we honor him with our lives and with our abilities and our families, our homes, our gifts, our talents. We honor the Lord with those things and the Lord will bring himself much glory from that. And isn't that what we want for the Lord to receive glory? You know we can't outgive him. There's no way. And even if we, like a Robert Arthington, gave him every single cent that we, we have, can you imagine standing before the Lord at the judgment seat and the Lord saying, now because you did this, here's what I'm going to do for you. And somebody with such a heart would be thinking, Lord, how can I use this for your glory? And it should be that way. Uh, what we have belongs to him. And who we are as far as being saved and a Christian, we should glorify him for that because he has done so much for us. Father, we thank you for those who have gone before us, set such a good example, obeyed the scripture. God, we're asking that you'd use this message this morning, a little history uh, to to encourage us, to motivate us, to convict us if necessary about our shortcomings in honoring you. Well, Lord, may it not always be so. God, when we are called from this life, may it be said of us that we did honor you in every way possible with as much as possible. Lord, may we give in a sacrificial way God, would you bring yourself glory? Whether men see it or not, it doesn't matter. Lord, whether we see it or not, it doesn't matter. God, we know you'll use it, and we ask that you will. In Jesus' name, amen.